Welcome to today's UN75 moderated dialogue. Um, UN75, as you know, is a platform for engaging civil society views across the world in marking the United Nations 75th anniversary and reflecting on the issues that are pressing today. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to moderate uh, today's event of The Future is Unridden um, on Indigenous Voices Listening for Tomorrow. My name is Shamira de Gonzaga. I'm the Executive Director of World Council of Peoples for the United Nations, one of the partner organizations in this series, The Future is Unridden. I'd like to extend a special thanks to my colleague, Danielle Sweet, and her counterpart, Stephen Stapleton of Culture Runners for organizing this series. Um, why is today's event important? Um, so many reasons. When we talk about the UN 75th anniversary, we think about the Agenda 2030 for those of you who follow UN processes and the Sustainable Development Goals. What are Sustainable Development Goals if they don't include um, all members of society and the peoples who perhaps are the living testament to what means sustainability in a true sense. Um, and hence today, we have the opportunity to hear from leaders of different uh, native groups in the United States, what is today the United States and Canada, and um, to think about how traditional knowledge is actually not just something for the past, but also very much relevant for the present and future. Um, without going any further, I'd like to also just mention that this is a special date in history as it marks the Battle of Little Bighorn, which we will be hearing about a little bit more later in the discussion. Uh, and now I'd like to invite our uh, panelists who are joining us from different time zones to please uh, introduce yourselves. Perhaps, uh, Joseph Kunkel, you could start. Great. Well, thank you. I'm honored to be here this morning. I'm Joseph Kunkel, I'm a citizen of the Northern Cheyenne Nation, which is uh, in what is now uh, southeastern Montana. I'm the director of the Sustainable Native Communities Design Lab within Mass Design Group, a nonprofit design firm that is focused on building the capacity of our tribal leaders, tribal housing uh, groups, and just really looking at ways of uh, thinking about uh, the role of architecture as a method for healing in our communities and understanding ways to build their sovereignty um, uh, and reinforce the ideas around sovereignty. Um, excited to be here as part of the conversation and really looking forward to, um, uh, to the discussion ahead. So thank you. Uh, Larissa, would you care to introduce yourself, please? Larissa Fastworth. Hey, hey, honey, watch day. Larissa Pastor, Samachi Yapeshto. I'm a member of the Sachangu Lakota Nation, which is located in the state of, well, currently located um, in the state of South Dakota of what is now called the United States of America. I um, am currently speaking to you from um, Big Bear, California, which is uh, Southern California. And although this area was um, used, uh, chose, um, Trying to say shared by a lot of indigenous peoples is used as a hunting ground and a summer gathering place. Uh, the only real villages here were of the Serrano people of Southern California. And um, I am a playwright and theater maker, um, former dancer, and I um, create work uh, primarily as a form of social justice um, using the Western art form of theater to change both white and indigenous audiences in the ways that they view representation, the possibilities of representation of indigenous, indigenous people here in the United States of America. Thanks. Uh, Nathalie Bondil. Uh, Nathalie Bondil, I'm chief curator and the general director of uh, the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts from Canada. So uh, I talk to you uh, from Montreal, which is remains an unceded uh, territory from Iroquoian people. Uh, thank you, Nathalie. Uh, Aaron Leggett, would you introduce yourself as well? Thank you. Gali Ethlanda Shishida Aaron Leggett Gosh Danak Shi Uchada Danainak Shi. Hello, everybody. My name is Aaron Leggett. I'm the curator of Alaska History and Culture at the Anchorage Museum, and I'm the president and first chief of the native village of Aklutna. And the Anchorage Museum sits on the land of the native village of Aklutna. We're the only federally recognized tribe in our city. Uh, and a lot of my work is centered around finding the interaction between uh, 
um, indigenous communities and museums and finding ways to not only take those interactions within a museum, but also apply them outside of museums beyond the, the four walls uh, to create opportunities for people uh, to access uh, these kinds of collaborations in, in many different ways. Thank you so much. Um, for those of you joining us, uh, I'd just like to maybe share the, the outline. We'll have individual presentations and then we'll get into a group discussion um, and also bring in questions and comments from those of you joining us wherever you may be. Um, as our panelists have shared where they are sitting, I should also mention that I'm joining you from what is today uh, the state of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Uh, this land was uh, once home to the Guataca tribe, who according to historians were uh, killed, not uh, by traditional force because they could not be defeated easily, but through the intentional introduction of smallpox. Um, and that is where, where I'm joining you from right now. Um, I would like to maybe uh, follow on that thread, speaking about recognizing the past, which has so often been erased, um, starting with uh, you, Joseph. You have been recognized for your work in many areas, including the Cheyenne Healing Trail. Uh, would you share with everyone a little bit about the meaning of that and uh, how it came to be? For sure, no, thank you. Um, the Northern Cheyenne Healing Trail, uh, thinking about the history and history being erased uh, is kind of the premise of how we, uh, and not just me, uh, this, this is a project that really lifts up the history of uh, the breakout at Fort Robinson, what is now Nebraska, uh, it was now located in Nebraska. And the, the, the Northern Cheyenne Healing Trail, it, it really commemorates uh, the efforts by our two chiefs, Chief Little Wolf and Chief Dull Knife, and the the ability for them to kind of take their two bands, which eventually became my ancestors, uh, to break out and 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 move their bands northward towards Montana. Well, uh, during that time, uh, during the breakout, uh, a massacre ensued. Uh, the cavalry uh, went ahead and rounded up and uh massacred our our ancestors during that time and uh this story while hasn't really been told uh the the, the ability to kind of talk about that that connection to the massacre site the connection between fort robinson and 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 this massacre has not been told in in, in current times i mean uh and and this all came about by one of my relatives uh ancestors now edna white crane who just actually passed this past weekend uh, where she more than 20 years ago with her her relatives went to the site and found, and knew the history and knew the stories but um the only thing that commemorated the site was a sign that was uh, shot full of bullets and to know that that was part uh, of a history that was kind of forgotten and not told and the only commemoration was a, a, a sign that said at this point in time there was a breakout. And so what we're doing is connecting the, the trail in which our ancestors broke out, connecting Fort Robinson to the massacre site and, and really looking at ways in which this could be a point of healing. Um, uh, we have generations of trauma, generations of cultural eraser, erase, our culture being erased. And so how do we leverage architecture and think about this trail, trail as, a, as a point of healing, not only just for our people uh, in Northern Cheyenne, but both for Native and non-Natives. Uh, this is a point in which both sides need to take precedent and, and really think about ways in which uh, Natives and non-Natives are part of the dialogue and understand the historic trauma that has been caused um, and, and ways in which we can really think about moving moving that bar forward and, and, and teaching our, our, our youth, our next generation of tribal leaders, what does it mean to think about the past so that we can heal here in the present and move towards a future that really lifts up our culture, our communities and our, 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 our spaces. Thank you for, for that work that you're doing. And in addition to, to that work about acknowledging the past and the healing associated with that, you're also taking forward 
um, traditional knowledge in the area of design and building um, from your communities and bringing that into the present with your sustainable communities uh, native collaborative could you share a little bit about the work that you're doing in that capacity and how you're perhaps connecting with um, with different tribes um, all of which have their own unique uh, traditions even if they may face uh, similar issues overall oh for sure all right um I'm a community member of my own tribe. I, I, I'm home when I'm on our own lands. And, and for us to engage with other federally recognized tribes, other non-recognized tribes is, is, is an effort in which, I mean, we can call it decolonizing architecture or ways of really thinking about uh, engaging with tribal communities around the country and, and, and up into Canada. But how are we kind of uh, creating space for dialogues to happen? How are we creating uh, an understanding ways in which architecture, which is based in a Beaux Arts or a Western ideology, and, and, and reframing that conversation so that natives, indigenous peoples can be part of the conversation? And uh, right from the very basics of uh, the kind of Western thought of a groundbreaking, how do we, instead of break the ground, which is very much a, a, a harmful way of thinking about developing the land, or, 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 or how do we reframe that and think about a ground celebration, or how do we really think about ways in which we can celebrate a place and celebrate a people uh, and, and lift up that voice from a point of being. And so we're working uh, across the country with, uh, the, the goal is how are we impacting all 574 federally recognized tribes? and and non-recognized non, non tribes to understand how they can have access to professional skill sets like architecture, engineer, plan, and planning skill sets to lift up what architecture could, could mean. I mean, historically, architecture has hurt our communities from housing to healthcare to health facilities, and not also to mention our boarding schools. Uh, and so how can we reframe those contexts and really understand how the built environment could be leveraged for a point of healing? And I think that's really something that we're, we're genuinely interested in and trying to understand ways in which we can bring these skill sets and good design to our, our indigenous populations, populations that just have not had access to what uh, contemporary Western society has. Thank you so much, uh, Joseph. And on, on that thread of having um, things dictated to, to your communities as opposed to uh, being uh, an expression that would be truly representative. Um, I think our next panelist, Larissa Fastworth, you have a lot to say about that as well uh, with your work in media, uh, television and theater specifically. Um, I was wondering if you could share a little bit about your journey and uh, in particular your experience with trying to have uh, indigenous peoples actually cast uh, in your productions and what you call your depressing success, the, the Thanksgiving play for which you have um, won so much recognition. Yeah, hi, thank you. Yeah, I um, ironically, I started, I, I was a dancer in my first career in the ballet dance, classical ballet dance, so I could get more um, distance from my traditional people in that. And um, ironically, I started writing, uh, I made the decision to write when I was speaking at the United Nations in Geneva. Uh, a while back, I was speaking at the um, uh, at a panel about uh, globalization, indigenous peoples, and and about positive uh, programs that were using filmmaking and indigenous peoples and giving them the power to represent themselves. And at that time, I was still a performer and trying to figure out what my next career would be after ballet. And I um, was <laughs> literally in the middle of a talk, and I realized you know, with everyone with the little ear cups on and. And I started crying and I realized that I had to uh, take control of the narrative, that that was my responsibility going forward. It was no longer just fight against, you know, poor narratives of, of indigenous peoples, at least, and I'm speaking specifically to the United States because that's my only experience. So indigenous peoples of the United States of America and, um, and that I needed to become, or in that moment, I knew I needed to become a writer and I need to control these narratives and, and, and use whatever power I could. So I say that because it's really important that the reason I became a writer was not an artistic expression, but it was always um, with a responsibility of representation and responsibility of change and social justice. Um, and so that colors everything I do and the reason I do everything I do. So um, jumped to you know 13, 14 years later and um, 
I've been very fortunate to have a, a, a continuous career in both theater and film and television here in, in the United States of America. But with my theater work, I would get commissioned to write these plays and people, the, the theater that paid me to write the play always wanted to you know, include the indigenous people on whose land they're on. I always have challenges to each theater company of how they have to engage with the local indigenous populations. And we do all these things and it's been great, but then those plays wouldn't get produced again. It would only be produced by the original um, commissioner. And what I heard again and again was the main reason was casting, was that um, they said that my plays were quote uncastable um, because there's still a perception that there are so few Native American people in this particular country that um, they can't find anyone to play the roles. And that was even said about a play of mine that had one half Native American character. And I was told that was not castable. Um, and so I, I was getting tired. I'd reached kind of a, a ceiling of the, the level I was at as a playwright and I was getting tired of it. So I said, okay, fine. This is what you're gonna say American theater. I know that audiences really want to hear about indigenous issues because there's nowhere else to learn about them. We are not taught about them in school. We're not taught about them in university. We're not taught about them accurately at pretty much anywhere um, in you know, regular white um, American society. And I know they wanna learn these things. My plays sell out. My plays do incredibly well for the theaters that they're in. So I said, great. I know audiences wanna know these things. And um, in, in America, audiences are primarily white. And so I said, so I'm gonna create a play that is for people that can pass for white, um, discussing these issues and dealing with these issues from the white point of view and from them failing horribly in trying to deal with indigenous contemporary issues. And so that was the Thanksgiving play. And although I do encourage that people um, uh, of color who can pass for white are, are cast in these roles, often there are a lot of white folks cast in them. You know, the, like I, as you said, I call it my most depressing success because um, it made me the first indigenous playwright in the history of American theater to be one that's have one of the top 10 most produced plays in America um, because it's for people that look white. Um, the good news is though, which, so that's sad. The good news is the play does all the things I want it to do. It um, does the amount of investigation and questioning. And it really forces audiences, all audiences to either identify themselves or in the case of indigenous folks and in the case of white folks, and then to question, question everything, question why do you believe these things? Why do you believe what you've been told? Um, from the title, it's primarily about um, the American uh, mythology of Thanksgiving, of the first Thanksgiving, which is entirely a myth. Um, there's almost nothing from that mythology that we're taught that was actually true. And so, um, you know, taking that and, and, and causing audiences to find, see themselves reflected in those characters, those white characters, but then also say, wow, you know, why do I believe these things? Why do I follow these things? So um, although it was a, a strange path to that as a writer to get to that place of having to produce a play with four white passing characters, I'm really excited about the amount of work it's done in the nation because it is one of the most produced plays in the nation. It um, is reaching, you know, thousands and thousands of people and causing to have to think about these things for many people for the first time because Thanksgiving is a beloved holiday in the United States. And um, so it's, it's, you know, it's successful, it's great. Now, it, and it has opened the doors for me to do a lot of other work. I'm now developing several film and TV projects that are native centered, that have native characters in the center of them that are contemporary. Um, I almost always write about contemporary women. So contemporary strong native women who are leading these pieces and I'm being allowed now because of, um, you know, the privilege I was given from that particular play to create these pieces in the way that I always wanted to create them before, but I didn't feel like film and TV um, was willing to do previously. So there is some hope. We'll see how it goes. Thank you so much, Larissa. And uh, maybe later in the discussion, I I'd love for you to share with everyone a little bit about how you're reversing what you call the extractive model of the arts, but mm -hmm. that we'll get back to that a little bit later. Um, I'd like to segue now to, um, to Nathalie who uh, on this topic that Larissa just introduced for us in terms of uh, you know, misrepresenting and uh, distorting in many cases, indigenous history. Uh, Nathalie in the museum world, not exclusively with indigenous peoples, but in, in many cases, there are challenges of cultural appropriation of objects having been stolen and then appearing in museum collections. Um, yourself as director of the Fine Arts Museum in, in Montreal, you have uh, directly uh, experienced this issue and tried to work with indigenous communities to rectify some of the damage that was done. 
Um, I know you're gonna be sharing your screen with us in a moment to show some examples of this. Um, and uh, so the floor is yours. And my apologies, everyone, if uh, I cut you off at the end of the six minutes, it's just to keep the discussion flowing. No uh, disrespect intended. Uh, please, Nathalie. Nathalie, you're, you're on mute. Could you unmute yourself, please? Great. Thank you, Shamina. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I will uh, share donc, uh, with uh, pleasure and humility donc, some uh, experiences donc, uh, I had to uh, leave donc, as a museum director. And uh, I just want to share donc, the uh, uh, images uh, which introduce you to Canada and uh, with this uh, first uh, very powerful and even iconic uh, work made by the Métis uh, Aboriginal artist, David Garneau. Uh, from, uh, he's also a professor and an artist from the University of Regina. And uh, this, um, this painting, which is in our collection, okay, is very clear about uh, the uh, uh, misunderstanding between okay, the uh, Aboriginal culture and the not Aboriginal culture, with not to confuse politeness with agreement. Uh, in fact, uh, when you see this uh, painting, you, you see uh, the leader of the Chiniki band of the Stony Nakoda people okay, in uh, Alberta uh, with a Monty, the perfect uh, Canadian Monty. And uh, it is inspired by a 50s postcard. And in fact, it is ironically portraying the men shaking their left hands. But in fact, uh, through the bubbles, you we can see how donc, uh, is illustrated the relationships founded in a misunderstanding. And it's very true because in Canada, 15% of uh, our population uh, is uh, Aboriginal. And in fact, uh, uh, there was a very important commission uh, uh, entitled Truth and Reconciliation from 2007 to 2015, uh, which really tried to uh, qualify this uh, cultural genocide. There is uh, still donc, a lot of discussion about the term of just cultural genocide or genocide, but it is admitted by everybody. And what we see is that among uh, one Canadian, uh, among two, donc, uh, the reality of the Aboriginal people in Canada is just about culture. They consider Aboriginal uh, people, Métis, Inuit and First Nations as a different cultural population and they don't really understand that uh, they are uh, their own right donc, which are included in the Canadian in constitution. So we yeah. still ha have a lot to do in terms of um, reconciliation. This is just one example about uh, how, um, a reconciliation uh, I was happy to do and to organize in our museum. Uh, I organized an exhibition on haute couture with the French designer, Jean-Paul Gauthier, you can see here the brown one. And in this uh, exhibition, there was a hairdress, of course, the typical Aboriginal uh, hairdress with feather. And obviously the couturier has been accused, and of course the museum has been accused of a cultural appropriation. It was in 2017. I must say that this address was exhibited before everywhere without any criticism. But in 2017, it was the anniversary of Canada. And of course, this anniversary of 150 years uh, in Canada means nothing for the First Nations who were there um, much uh, before. And uh, I explained on the case to uh, Jean-Paul Gauthier. As a French, he did not understand anything about this reality. And I did learn a lot. And in fact, I didn't want also to have this kind of censorship, but I really want to find a constructive uh, path. And this is how all together, like, and especially thanks to the uh, Aboriginal artist Kent Monkman, you can see here, not, uh, they imagine a symbolic union between the designer and Kent Monkman. And so what you see here is an artistic performance of another feather in her bonnet with Kent Monkman, uh, uh, as a bespirited people, he plays the role of mischief eagle testicle. Those two artists are very much engaged into LGBT uh, right, and so they wanted to uh, create this uh, wonderful artistic moving union in order to support their um, their um, 
the LGBT uh, right. This is another way to uh, not to uh, keep with indifference, not to uh, censorship, but really to make bridges between people, which is very important for me. Uh, and uh, you can see you know, one pavilion of the Montreal Museum of Foreign Arts, and of course, you know, just in front of this typical Belle Epoque uh, marble uh, uh, fine arts uh, temple, uh, in fact, there is this uh, totem. This totem is uh, made by Charles Joseph from the Quaklut nation in the west of uh, the uh, country, uh, from uh, the British Columbia. And in fact, it talks a lot about the territorial acknowledgement because we have this fabulous uh, totem, which is stand stood just in front of this architecture. And it talks about like, Montreal, Montreal as like, uh, the is historically uh, gathering place for many First Nations. And uh, it is also important to uh, understand that the, uh, this totem residential pole has been made by an artist, Charles Joseph, who was when he was young and a child in a residential school. This is really a it's terrible uh, part of uh, the Canadian history because look, until 1996, residential schools were open in Canada. And so there were many children uh, uh, which were sent from their family look, in those schools. And uh, Charles Joseph came and installed uh, with the agreement of the local uh, Aboriginal communities this uh, important uh, statement um, about the residential schools. I just want to say that at one point, you know, there were teenagers in the street and they stole a hand. They stole a hand. So it was a lot of emotion through the city, even the mayor who were looking for uh, this hand. And we saw through the camera that it was just something because of teenagers, they were drunk, it was midnight. And so it was a lot of um, uh, emotion. And we were very happy because a few days after, uh, we found this uh, very uh, moving uh, uh, small of, uh, sheet of paper who says, well, we didn't understand what we did. We are so sorry, so sorry for any pain and anger we have created. And it's all about education. And I think that uh, it uh, says a lot about the, uh, the role the museums can play okay, within the city. It's about- you, Nathalie, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but just so, um, forgive me, as I mentioned, so, just to, to move forward. I, I appreciate that you shared that story. And I think we're gonna get back in the broader discussion to looking at how um, exactly. museums and other institutions can play a role in that education. Um, I'd like to, uh, to say with that, on that thread, the role of museums, uh, turn over to Aaron, as you're also a curator at the Anchorage Museum, as well as being the chief of, um, of your tribe in, the, in that specific area. And Aaron, you had mentioned that it was 40 years that the, before the museum actually had an exhibition on the, about the people whose homeland the museum sits on. Um, Aaron, could you share a little bit about, uh, about that experience? Sure, it was actually 45 years. Um, but uh, so in 2006, after I was out of high school, or uh, excuse me, when I was out of college, I was contacted by the Anchorage Museum to do what was going to be the first ever uh, international exhibit on the indigenous people, my people of South Central Alaska, the Denina. And for the next seven years, I worked closely with the museum, traveling around the world, identifying pieces in places as far away as Helsinki, Finland, St. Petersburg, Russia, the British Museum, the Ethnological Museum in Berlin, uh, New York at the American Museum of Natural History, New Haven, Connecticut, and um, at Yale. And in that process, we had a series of uh, collaborations with a Denine Advisory Committee um, experts. Really what I wanted to do was to do identify all the objects that I could find in museums around the world and try to bring back as many as I could for this uh, exhibition that lasted uh, about four months. The, although the exhibit itself was um, this, you know, temporal moment, uh, the 
the lasting impact of it was uh, a comprehensive exhibition catalog that was produced that we spent almost as much time as the exhibition on. And I think it also was a, a mindset shift for the Anchorage Museum when it realized that it had a role to really call to attention the fact that, that, that our institution sits on my ancestors' traditional homeland. And so first in 2015, um, in, uh, in conjunction with uh, Obama coming to Alaska and a series of, and the Arctic Council uh, having a meeting in Anchorage, on the front of the Anchorage Museum, we uh, put a traditional greeting um, over the facade that said Chinan Guninu, which means thank you, you came here, or you came to this place. And it was supposed to be up for a couple of weeks, you know, when, when the dignitaries were there and um, uh, Obama was visiting, but it was so well received that we kept it up throughout the entire winter. And one of the most moving things that I'll remember is I talked to other Denina people and one of them uh, from another village had expressed this, uh, she had heard from another one of her relatives that was living on the streets who was homeless at the time, that when he walked by and he looked up at the museum and he saw the words Chinan Guninier, it, it filled him with a sense of pride. And he knew that even though his circumstances were pretty, pretty tough at the moment, that he felt like he had a home in that moment. And so those kinds of things are, are really, to me, uh, what's important. The reason for the exhibition and, and the reason the work that I do is that uh, Anchorage as a city is very young. It's only a little over 100 years old. Um, and although half the entire state of Alaska's population lives in our traditional homeland, until very recently, nobody knew we existed. When I was 19 years old, I started working uh, at another institution in Anchorage called the Alaska Native Heritage Center. And I met other young um, Alaska Native people. And I told them I was Denina. And they said, what's that? And I said, well, we're the Athabascans that live in this area. And they said, well, I didn't know this was a native place. And you wouldn't know it was a native place because there was no meaningful representations. And so in that moment when other indigenous people, some of whom had grown up in Anchorage, told me that they didn't know this was a native place. I knew that I had to make it my mission in life uh, to change that narrative. And I'm glad that with my work, um, both at the Alaska Native Heritage Center and at the Anchorage Museum and being the president and chief of the tribe and the curator of Alaska history and culture that I've been able to put forward this idea that this is our unceded land in our traditional territory. And uh, we're getting, you know, uh, formal land acknowledgements and recognition. It can become overwhelming at times for a tribe of 300 people. And I do my best to accommodate those that put out requests. A running joke is before too long, I'll be doing, you know, land acknowledgements or welcomes at uh, weddings and bar mitzvahs, but, um, but the important thing is that people are starting to recognize that there's a history that exists before the founding of Alaska's largest city and that the indigenous people, unlike a lot of places in the United States, uh, in Alaska, native people for the most part have not been uh, removed from their traditional homeland. So um, although the history goes back, you know, a uh, hundred years of, of a settlement, my people's history goes back over a thousand years. And so despite all the hotels, offices, or shopping malls that are put up or museums, I know that this is still and will always continue to be my ancestors' homeland. Um, thank you, Aaron. And while we're, as we're moving into the uh, more general discussion with, with all of you here, um, I'd like to just stay with you one, one more moment, Aaron, because there was one thing you had shared um, with me when we spoke before the dialogue about the education system. And um, you said that even when curricula is being introduced into the school system to try and, and correct that, uh, that gap in, in knowledge and history, 
the teachers themselves don't necessarily know how to teach it. Could, could you elaborate a little bit? Sure. Uh, within the uh, Anchorage School District, it wasn't until the graduating class of 2003 that they were required to take a semester in high school of Alaska Studies. And I just heard a statistic last night from a teacher that Alaska Studies is the most failed uh, high school class um, of any. And a lot of it does stem from the fact that the there is no official textbook or curric there's a curriculum, but it's not well-structured and it leaves a lot uh, to be desired. And so one of the major efforts, the long-term goals that I have is to um, create uh, a, a, a comprehensive textbook that really uh, creates the tools that teachers can effectively teach um, Alaska history. Part of the problem is that in Alaska, we have such a transient population. 60% uh, of my parents' generation were not born uh, in Alaska. And so we have a lot of people that come to Alaska as either, you know, in the military or an adventure or uh, are attracted to the outdoors, but don't have a connection to this place. And at the end of the day, there is a question about how much are they truly invested in seeing um, this place flourish? Is this, in other words, just a stop off on their career, uh, a foreign destination, or is this a place that they truly want to see um, grow? And I, mm -hmm. luckily, my generation is starting to uh, realize that and, and, and kind of bring it up. Thank you. Um, speaking of, of correcting uh, the way things are taught, uh, Larissa, you have a um, a story maybe connecting back to this date that we mentioned earlier in terms of the, the Battle of the Little Bighorn, which you learned one way and the, the dominant uh, school system teaches in a very different way. Could you perhaps share some of that with us? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. so I'm Lakota. Um, so we were uh, one of several tribes at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Um, I'm Sichanga Lakota, the better known folks, uh, the leaders of it, uh, Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull were Oglala, or our neighbors um, to the West. Um, so yeah, it's just, it was just very strange because you know we grew up learning it as um, obviously a, a victory, a really good one, um, and it's a really positive story. Um, and it was just really interesting the first time I went to um, the site of the Battle of Little Bighorn and I was like, whoa, it's, it's taught as a tragedy. And everything about it was, you know, I mean, of course people died and that is a tragedy. You know, your loved one is your loved one. Um, but the whole um, framing of it was as a negative and a tragedy and um, of all the, you know, every, everything was, was from entirely the white point of view and entirely about native aggressors and, they, and and those sorts of things. I understand in the following years, it, it, previous years, it's um, it has gotten better. But when I was there as a child, it was entirely from a white settler point of view and entirely um, about this horrible massacre of these poor white folks. Never mind, there were three massive columns of military that were strategically placed in three different directions to come in and and crush all the native people in the Powder River region and, and destroy them. That was their goal. That was why they were there was to destroy them. And the fact that, you know, the native people um, were able to do the, you know, defend themselves and, and win this battle um, was not the way it was taught at all. And it was, it was really, you know, but that's just to be perfectly honest, that's typically American history. That's how everything's taught. Um, and it's slowly starting to change. I, I totally believe in art as a, way to do that, that art is one of the most effective ways that we can create that change. Because right now we can start with maybe the children, but if we wanna create change in the people that are adults now, it's too late to go back to their education system, which has to be completely rethought and isn't gonna happen in the next even 10 years because it's so deep. The foundation is completely wrong for the way history is taught in this country. So if we're gonna start completely over, that's gonna take a long time. So the arts are the best way that I see in re-educating um, the population of America to understand how um, wrong everything was taught to them and how that they need to reframe it all going forward or we're never gonna see the kind of changes that we want. Um, thank you, Larissa. Uh, Joseph uh, or Natalie, do you have anything you'd like to add to this uh, subject, which I think is cross-cutting in terms of having to, to reframe 
history? Uh, Joseph, is there anything yeah, you'd like to add? No, I mean, changing the narrative, thinking about how we can, I mean, building on Aaron and Larissa's point, like how can we be in charge of our own narrative, right? And I think that's exactly what Larissa is doing in terms of writing and, and the work that uh, we're doing in terms of having native architects and native designers designing their own uh, buildings, places, spaces, and, and really being in charge of that narrative, right? And, and I think that is so important when we're, we're actually giving acknowledgement to the history is acknowledgement to the present and, and knowing how our cultures and our, our, our communities and our places can move forward into, in, into the future. And I think that's exactly what we're doing in terms of uh, how are we educating natives and non-natives to understand these histories and moving forward in a way that we can lift up that conversation. Um, and I think future leaders are going to be doing that and i see that as a role of the work that we're doing uh, building that capacity to ensure that we can uh, progress forward with a, with a seat at the table um, speaking of a seat at the table natalie uh, based on on that experience that you shared where perhaps the the communities that should have been involved didn't have a seat at the table initially has that changed and how do you find non-Native communities responding to this educational efforts that you're trying to encourage? Um, everybody talks about decolonizing arts, decolonizing our perspectives, decolonizing some museums and collection. And I think that the, the secret is really to have a well-balanced dialogue between communities and a respectful way. And uh, in fact, uh, it's uh, sometimes people has impression that they are losing power because they give the, um, the possibility to talk to someone else. And just the fact that we open the debate, we open our table, we open our collections to other communities, to uh, indigenous peoples, but also to all kinds of uh, uh, minorities uh, people, is not that we are losing power, we are sharing the power and we are learning from what, uh, one uh, each other. So I think that uh, I'm very confident because now we are really seeing a huge shift with the new, new generations. And uh, the result is that it's much more interesting for all of us because we understand that we are the uh, the recipiendary of collections who are called permanent, but our perspective are impermanent. Uh, thank you for that, Nathalie. While we're on the topic of education, um, we have a, a question that is um, addressed to uh, Larissa, uh, Aaron and Joseph about um, native languages being taught in the school. And if that's uh, the case, and if it is, is it something that's only being applied to Native American students or for everyone? This is a, a question from Maria. Um, anyone who'd like to, to answer? Joseph? Uh, sure. Uh, Larissa? Okay, I was gonna say, it's easy for us. So Lakota language is not taught in um, non-Lakota schools, no. Um, it's only taught, as far as I know, I, I mean, there might be, you know, a couple of random programs, I think maybe in Minneapolis Twin Cities has one, at, but it, they're, they're so small. Um, they're not, it is not taught um, even um, full time reliably in all of our Lakota schools as well. Um, and that's a big problem. We're, we're it's definitely an endangered language for us. And, and I think in terms of language, it's a I mean, and it's very much the same in, uh, I think many of the communities that we've kind of practiced and, and, and have, have worked in. But I think this idea around language is so important because I mean, when we're thinking about the work that we do and you think about architecture, you think about building, you think about all these contexts that are very much based in Western thought and, 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 and Western language. Like this idea of, uh, we, we talk about building wealth through accessing and having access to housing or, or, or being able to own your home. And, and, and that idea and that sense of ownership is not necessarily something that in 
my own community, we have a full sense of, right? Within our own language, that, that idea of owning something, owning a home, it, there's no word for ownership in our language. And so that whole concept is not, it's hard to say that uh, you own a home and, 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 then, and it breaks down from there. So if you can't own a home, how do you build wealth in, in a Western context, in, a, in, in, in everyday society? And so that reframing of these words, it's like, uh, yes, we, the, the kind of reframing of ownership becomes, I'm going to take care of this while I'm here on this earth. I'm going to kind of uh, move forward an idea. Uh, and, and I think in the built environment, in architecture and design, we have to be cognizant of how we use language when we're working in in mm -hmm. indigenous communities. And that's not to say that we need to dumb language down. I think our, our indigenous language are so uh, complex and so rich that we need to understand how to translate that. And, and, and going back to kind of Natalie's point around civil dialogue or having a dialogue, I think that's where it starts and, and, and making sure that we're hearing community and that we are uh, at the table engaging in civil discourse, uh, both from a political standpoint, from a financial standpoint, from an economic development standpoint. I think that's all important in ways we can come around the table and hear one another, both native and non-native, or native and or indigenous and non-indigenous. Thank you, Joseph. Um, Aaron, uh, you mentioned uh, signage being included in, in your language. Is that something that's uh, making its way into the school system as well? Um, it's not making it into the school system per se yet, but it is certainly popping up around uh, our city. And it has a way of filtering down, obviously, uh, to children um, becoming comfortable with the words. And I think to the point, you know, about the importance of language, I think w the more we're able to get our language out mm -hmm. into the general public, the better understanding the general public has of their sense of place. There's so much encoded information in our language. A good example was that in 1964, the, uh, the largest uh, earthquake ever recorded in um, the United States happened here in and around Anchorage, it was 9.2. And there was a lot of devastation uh, throughout South Central Alaska. But one area in Anchorage um, called uh, Turnigan by the Sea was incredibly, I mean, whole houses were slid into, uh, into the ocean. Uh, but the Denina name for that area uh, is called Nun Leskedi, and it means rotten land. And the builders never asked anybody uh, from our community whether they should be building these beautiful, essentially what in those days would have been million dollar homes. Uh, we would have told them not to, but we weren't even considered. And in fact, there were actually housing covenants that even prevented us from being able to purchase those homes. Uh, were we able to have had the the, the financial means to do it. So that's just an extreme example, I think, of where indigenous knowledge of place names and places are really important. And the more people understand those names and places and, and words for plants and animals, I think the richer all our communities become. Thank you, Aaron. Um, and also still with the topic of education, we received another question um, asking if non-tangible aspects of indigenous culture can be taught in the school system. So aspects uh, referring to, to spirituality or ritual or things that perhaps are, are very uh, private and specific to, to each culture. This is a, a question I believe from Rory from Oman. I and mean, that's entirely up to the people, right? Um... I mean, that's the, you know, I talked about one half of my playwriting earlier. The other half of my career is creating work um, by, with, for, and in indigenous communities. And um, we've, you know, I, I, all of that is, um, it goes back to a lot of things we've been discussing, like power and, you know, the power needs to be with indigenous peoples and, and settler community does need to give up power. They have been in power and they've held power over us for centuries now. They need to give up power. They need to have less power and they need to give it to the indigenous populations on whose lands they're standing and profiting from. And that goes, so that's, this, that's the foundation of everything that um, 
if you know any of these things are to be taught, they need to be taught because the indigenous people on whose land you're standing say that they want them to be taught. I worked in Cherokee, North Carolina for a long time and they do not allow non-Cherokee people to speak their language on stage or non-indigenous people to speak their language on stage. So that's their choice as an sovereign nation. So, you know, you to just you don't get to have something just because you want it. Um, the way that we make plays with indigenous communities is um, something we talked about, you referenced earlier, but the Western arts have traditionally been an extraction industry to indigenous cultures. They come in, they take what they want, they profit from it and they leave. And um, our goal is using theater, a Western art, a, a Western style um, version of theater. There's of course, tons of indigenous theaters, um, but using that to give power back to people to serve indigenous populations as opposed to um, indigenous populations serving art. And so everything we do is about giving power to the people. We give power to them to make every decision on what is represented, how it's represented, um, who represents them, who it's, even who gets to come. All of that is up to the people, the indigenous people on whose land we're standing. And that's, in my opinion, how all these questions go back to that. You have to go back to those indigenous people you at, and every single nation you're on, of which there's hundreds in the United States of America, and say to them, you know, A, just give them the power and then you don't have to say anything. But um, right now, while we still have white folks in power in charge of these school systems and things, um, they need to come to these indigenous people and find out what they want. And so all those questions go back to that. It's up to the people. It's their land, it's their nation. Thank you, Larissa. And speaking of extractive industries, um, because we're still in the context of this UN 75 platform and sustainable development goals, I think it's important to touch on environmental questions because um, obviously so many projects uh, have gone through indigenous land. Some of this has um, you know, garnered international attention, some not. Um, Aaron, you had shared an interesting story in terms of how in Alaska, very often the groups that are designed to protect environmental interests don't necessarily take into consideration the needs of indigenous groups and might even be going against them. Um, I thought that was an interesting point to raise for our you know, UN connected community that might be tuning in. Uh, could you speak to that a little bit and, and anyone else also have, please welcome to join, jump in. Sure. Um, you know, in Alaska, you know, there's there's this perception of this pristine, untouched wilderness, you know, sort of a Henry David Thoreau, kind of the ideal of the, you know, no human has set foot in that. And that's a false narrative. Indigenous people have utilized pretty much all of, you know, their traditional homelands uh, or have connections to it, at least. And so there's no such thing as this wild, you know, it's, it's not like the moon, you know, where, and, and even indigenous people would say that we've been there. So, um, but the important thing is that this idea of locking up these resources or not, not locking up these areas and not allowing indigenous people to continue to practice uh, their subsistence hunting and fishing rights or ceremonies uh, can have a damaging effect. Obviously, uh, is it as damaging as massive uranium mines or resource extraction? No, uh, it's not. But I think the important thing to recognize is that indigenous people have been stewards and caretakers of their lands, but they've also used the resources of their lands in a sustainable way that created systems that when uh, colonial settlers came into these places, they saw it as this, you know, pretty much unmodified landscape when in fact, it had been carefully uh, developed over uh, thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And there are some examples like mm -hmm. on Easter Island where uh, the indigenous people actually, you know, it was out of balance and ultimately the people disappeared from there. Um, thank you. Would anyone else like to, to speak to the environmental issues connection? Yeah. Um, I uh, totally agree with Aaron because uh, obviously in Canada, a uh, uh, main part of uh, the indigenous communities don't live in the very north. And of course, don't the global warming is very, uh, um, important for those communities. 
And uh, we, I think that uh, we can learn so much thanks to uh, the uh, Inuit communities, for example, and uh, I would say donc, from the indigenous uh, peoples because they have this uh, specific relation with the land, with the animals, uh, we, uh, thanks to their spir spirituality, which we have to uh, understand now. I do think that uh, for donc, our generation and the younger generations, we have so many issues with nature, uh, with uh, uh, the, our relation uh, with uh, the animals and uh, with biodiversity. So accepting cultural bi uh, biodiversity is, will also teach us donc, how to manage because our religion Donc, consider that we have to explode, we can uh, explode and use those natural resources, uh, including uh, animals um, like that. And I think that it is so important for us right now, if we want to uh, defend and if we want to protect our environment, if we want to act uh, against global warming, if we want to uh, protect nature, forest, etc to understand from the philosophy, to understand from the indigenous practices. Please, uh, Larissa. I would also say, just to take it a step further as well, that we also need to protect the indigenous peoples. The very first climate refugees in the United States of America were in Louisiana, an indigenous tribe in Louisiana. The second climate refugees in the United, recognized climate refugees in the United States of America were in Alaska. Um, those people, I'm, I'm sick and tired of us being on the front lines, of us getting our communities destroyed, of us losing our lands. So we need to um, not just listen, but we need to really put power, money, and time into protecting these people because we're not going to be able to listen to them if they're all gone. Thank you. Um, speaking of front lines, uh, I've been hearing that in the context of the COVID-19 uh, many indigenous communities have again been on the front line. Um, there's a question uh, to uh, both Aaron and Natalie about whether your museums in the context of, of this unusual circumstance have left your physical sites to actually be closer to, to people wherever they, they might be. Uh, Aaron or Natalie, do you have any, any ways? Uh, yes. Um... We do a lot of art therapy in our museum. Donc, we are very uh, uh, innovative, I must say, in this uh, in art therapy. And what is interesting is that culture means healing for many indigenous people here. So we learn thanks to them that culture can help them. We, uh, for example, we work a lot uh, with the uh, Inuit communities because uh, in Montreal, the most important uh, community of Inuit people outside of the Northern Territory is in Montreal. And obviously you know, there, are, uh, there are many homeless, there are many people without any uh, cultural uh, roots or families. So uh, we uh, did collaborate, uh, we do collaborate uh, with the uh, Cultural Institute of Nunavik with Avatak, and uh, they have their kind of embassy in the South, like in Montreal. And thanks to this collaboration, we learn and we uh, work for you know, those people who are in Montreal and who are really, uh, uh, they need to uh, reconnect with their own culture in order to, uh, um, to feel better. So I do think that uh, uh, there is something very important in the way how we can uh, link and connect with the uh, uh, indigenous uh, spirituality because it is uh, beyond um, the indigenous culture, very important for the way how we consider you human being, the mental health and the way how culture can uh, help us. Um, uh, Joseph? Please, and also Aaron. Uh, yeah, I mean, and this idea, I mean, the co what COVID, I think, is really showing us is, is the issues that are just inherently plaguing our, our indigenous communities. So when we talk about homeless, when we talk about uh, housing, when we talk about the built environment, many of our indigenous housing, uh, much of our indigenous housing is overcrowded. We, we don't necessarily see, in, uh, and, and that kind of exacerbates the spread of COVID. You know, the Navajo Nation being one of the, one, one prime example of how we're seeing it spread. 
I mean, what we have been doing is developing guidelines and, and, and offering our expertise in the built environment to kind of understand how can we think about the built environment as a healing exercise and how can we start to uh, understand ways in which we can use design, use architecture as a, as a way of kind of, uh, and, and decolonizing it in a way to offer opportunities to understand how we can uh, build better communities, build communities that have historically um, been been healing. If we look at our our our, our indigenous bands, the ways in which we uh, look at teepee encampments, we know we're not going to go back to teepees, but that type of architecture allowed for uh, flows of natural ventilation and air air to kind of work through itself. Now we're stuck in these boxes that don't breathe, that spread disease, uh, which is very much a Western context. Mm -hmm. And so how do we use and leverage those ind indigenous principles that we got right uh, prior to con Western contact and, and use that uh, in, in contemporary ways and in, in contemporary mm -hmm. ways of building it and, 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 and developing? And I think there's a, there's a connection there that we can, we can bridge. Thank you, Joseph. Um, Aaron, did, did you have anything uh, you wanted to add about how your museum is connecting with the community in this uh, time? Yeah, well, um, you know, one of the challenges we face here in Alaska is that we, you know, the state of Alaska represents one fifth the entire size of the continental US. Half of all the federally recognized tribes in the United States are in Alaska. And sort of where there's massive geographic distances. Uh, so it can become a challenge for us to connect to um, many of these communities. Nevertheless, we're working hard to always try to find innovative ways to be able uh, to do this. I think probably one of the biggest take homes out of this whole COVID situation is going to be uh, the use of like what we're doing right here on Zoom. I think we've kind of demystified, even though there's pretty poor internet connection in many of our communities, I think there will be more opportunities to connect at least virtually at first with outside communities. And also um, we're working with local indigenous artists and we have been. Uh, so if anything, I think what COVID has shined a light on is really kind of us redoubling our efforts and really making active commitments and making strong statements of why we're doing this. Um, thank you, Aaron. Um, I wanted to, to get into one more topic and also uh, bring in a couple more questions that were, were brought to us, which um, are thinking again about the United Nations context where there, there has been for many years a permanent forum of indigenous peoples. Um, I think uh, Larissa, you mentioned speaking at the UN in Geneva uh, in 2007, there was a declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples, which then you know, different uh, uh, recognized member states had to then uh, adopt and, and put into practice at the, the domestic level. One question is to what extent does that resonate with, uh, with your communities? Um, do you feel connected to these global level actions? Um, that exist. And I think uh, together with that, we could also think about um, the question of leadership um, and what kind of leadership is required for the future. You've spoken to, um, to changing sort of the dominant capitalist model, whether in the context of the arts and the, the very notion of ownership itself, Joseph, you mentioned. Um, so we think about the UN as wanting to be a uh, uh, set high standards for what leadership should be in the world. What, what is your take on that? And what would you like to see going forward? Yeah, I mean, I've always thought about, I mean, thinking about Indian country, thinking about our indigenous populations, I've kind of framed this as how do we lead from a, a perspective of vulnerability? And how do we really lead from that space, right? In, in many, unlike in, in a Western context, many of our indigenous leaders, while strong and, and, and they advocate for self-determination and sovereignty, we as, aren't necessarily cultivated or uh, primed for leadership in the contemporary context of Western society. 
right? And and so uh, like I, I never saw myself in this space. I never saw myself as kind of being a leader uh, working in, in the housing development space in Indian country. But uh, I but I kind of fell into this space. And so how do we lead from a place of vulnerability, knowing that we have generations of trauma? We 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 need to kind of acknowledge that and move on. And, and, and move in a way that we can also develop the next generation of, of indigenous leaders. And I think that's exactly what we're trying to do is, is attempting to find ways to bring up the next uh, generation of tribal designers, tribal architects to understand that they have a voice in the space that this, while, while you might not necessarily see it in the classroom today, we will get to that point and we need to uh, kind of Think about this as a uh, as an opportunity to be part of the conversation and be hopeful for what we can do and 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 and, and lean on our culture and lean on our past and and use that as a support to be present here in the future and and create structures and frameworks for us to understand how to move towards a future that includes us as a people and I think um, we will get there. And I'm very hopeful. And it's not hope that's just kind of just blatant hope. It's, it's hope based on our ancestral stories on, on, on our homelands uh, and, and our past indigenous, uh, chiefs and presidents and, and so on. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly hopeful for what we can do as a, as a people, as a collective people of indigenous people, not just uh, just one tribe or, 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 or one community. It's, it's a collective story. Uh, thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to this, um, notion of leadership? Um, we do have other, other questions also from the group. No. Okay. Uh, Anne from Norway is asking if, um, Indigenous nations in the US and Canada can join forces with environmental leaders to win more battles against the oppressive forces of the 21st century, especially the devastating destructive force of the industrial and fossil fuel companies. And that's interesting from, from Norway, a country that also has a, a big uh, dependence on the fossil fuels. Um, I'm, any uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one up. Um, I think, you know, within Alaska, um, you know, unlike the lower, uh, the rest of the United States, we don't have reservations. We have uh, corporations that were created by Congress and their job is to make money for their shareholders. And some of that money is developed from extractive resources or contracts with extractive resources. Uh, the key difference though, is that when that money is generated, it stays with the people. It's not being shipped out to uh, multinational corporations around the world. I also think that because of uh, indigenous ownership, there's a special level of, of care that is taken because they, the corporations are beholden to their people, to their shareholders that live in these environments. And that's not to say there aren't disagreements, but I think, you know, indigenous people, the more indigenous people can be involved in that power structure and, and share in the, the wealth of it, then the better the outcome. And also I think changing this uh, resource extraction model that that's sort of come in do it as fast and cheap and quick as possible and get out and leave, you know, a mess behind. Uh, where is like what we have been doing for thousands of years, is there a way that we can utilize a resource without completely uh, abusing the resource? And again, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be working toward uh, lessening our dependence on fossil fuels, but those fossil fuels are also the, the means in which uh, we as a society, especially in rural Alaska, depend on getting uh, food resources. Um, thank you, Aaron. Uh, mindful of, of the time, um, I think we're going to segue into some final thoughts from each of you, um, both personal and, and knowing that uh, this is in a sense also a, a message to the UN, even to the UN Secretary General and to the member states. 
um, that will gather there, whether virtually or not. Um, after the uh, final thoughts, we will also be introducing the some videos. So uh, I hope everyone please do uh, stay on uh, as you're joining us for, for two videos following um, our panelists' final remarks. Um, maybe, um, why don't we go in the in the reverse order uh, from last time and maybe Aaron, uh, do you have a, a final thought or message that you'd like to share with everyone today? Um, as far as a final thought, I, I think there's a combination of things and I, I've touched on several of them. One is getting indigenous voices into becoming uh, part of the solutions that our world faces is vitally important. Uh, but also I think looking at how can we honor uh, the contributions that indigenous people have had over thousands of years, um, the stewardship of the land, the, the knowledge that's been gained from these uh, areas, um, but also creating systems by which um, the wealth uh, that is being generated or the power and control can be shared. Thank you, uh, Aaron. Uh, Nathalie, uh, do you have a, a final thought? Yes, uh, I think that uh, it is a crucial moment for the United Nations Declaration for the Right of the Indigenous People, because if we consider that 20% uh, of the planet of the Earth uh, belong to uh, Indigenous people, who lives in 90 countries, 370 millions. And in fact, look, uh, these, uh, those territories are often uh, situated in areas that are preserved or thought after their natural resources. So I think that uh, it is very important if we want to face look, the uh, 21st century challenges to hear, to understand look, uh, those voices, those uh, uh, practices. And I would say, uh, we uh, change by exchanging without losing ourselves. It's a French philosopher from the Caribbean, uh, Edouard Bisson. So it's very important to acknowledge and move on together. Thank you, Nathalie. Uh, Larissa? Yeah, um, you know, I often say most of my work, the, the job of my work is to cause people to question, question everything they believe, question everything they've been taught, question everything they thought was true. Um, and, and I would say that, encourage that, especially for indigenous peoples of the United States, there's a lot of assumptions about what the United States is, is as far as its wealth and its access to every resource in the world. Um, most of our indigenous tribes do not have that. And you know, I'm not a proponent of poverty porn, we're rich in so many other things, but we are falling behind. If COVID has taught us nothing else, it's really shown us how far behind our tribes are and just being able to care for themselves because they've been denied that power from this government. Um, as much as I appreciate, and we all appreciate the um, declarations from the United Nations and the support they've given to things like um, home, Standing Rock. Um, unfortunately, this current government does not recognize the United Nations in pretty much any way at all. And really doesn't care much about what the United Nations has to say. So I really urge all of the NGOs that are involved, all of the individuals, you know, we need you directly here supporting us in the United States, supporting indigenous populations in our fight against this massive, massive machine, political machine that um, does not recognize what the UN um, says in any possible way um, and does not um, support us. And we need your direct support to come to indigenous populations and help us you know, chart our own futures based on our past. Thank you, Larissa. Uh, Joseph? Yeah, I mean, uh, this is such a crucial time, uh, the time of now, the time of today, uh, especially for indigenous populations. I think this idea, to, this is a moment, I think for the UN in particular, to listen and to hear from indigenous communities and really be clear about ways in which we can support indigenous frameworks, indigenous ways of thinking, and, and really start to kind of question uh, the structures that are in place and, and the structures that are are, 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 are the, the powerful structures that are in place. And I think we need to really be understanding how uh, the greater society can learn and listen and, and hear from, from our tribal communities. Because uh, I think 
this is a, a pivotal time of the death of normal. Normal was never normal for our indigenous communities. That kind, of, and so how can we kind of reframe what that looks like and how indigenous uh, peoples can be uh, the way the, a, a path forward uh, to how we think about um, what future development might look like for the for for the world. Thank you so much, uh, Joseph. And before introducing the, um, the final videos that we'll be showing, I just want to thank you all for the work you're doing to create those new structures, to point out the imbalances, um, the horrific gaps in, in knowledge and in recognition, and for helping everyone join you in this effort. Um, I look forward to, to learning more. I know we've only just scratched the surface today. So thank you for sharing your time. Uh, thank you to everyone who's joining us. Um, and uh, of course, this uh, dialogue will also be archived. So please feel free to, to share it for those who might not have been able to join today. Um, this will be uh, the, the goodbye from our panelists. Um, and I'll be uh, signing off soon as well to watch the videos. The first one is a short video by a gentleman by the name of Leon Grass, who sits on the site of the uh, Wounded Knee Massacre on the Oglala Lakota Pine Ridge Reservation in what's today South Dakota. My apologies if I mispronounced that. Um, we will see that video first, and then we will be seeing the trailer of a film by the name of Gather uh, by Sanjay Rawal, which was just premiered at the Human Rights Watch Film Festival and which speaks to indigenous food sovereignty issues um, in, the, in the USA. Uh, and uh, you can follow the actual release of that film on Instagram at Gather Film. Uh, so with that, uh, my personal again, goodbye and thank you. And please do stay on for the two videos to follow. It's been over a hundred donut years after the Battle of Little, Little Bighorn and uh, the government to uh, get rid of the tried to get rid of the Indian population. But the final conflict came down to Wounded Knee where they, it wasn't a battle, it was a massacre. Where we're still fighting a battle now where the, the white men brought these diseases to us and uh, we, we survived most of them. Now we're in a pandemic and this is another infectious disease. People are dying needlessly. The Washitas are taking the full brunt of it because they don't, they don't know how to uh, act to this situation. Our, our reservation is still intact, even though after all this, the, the, the atrocities and the plagues that we endured in the past. So, and uh, what I wanna do is uh, just let you know that we're still in Wounded Knee and uh, we, uh, we pray, we, we're spiritual people. So we, I, I pray a lot, as much as I can. And, um, I pray mostly for the health of everybody, you know, not just our, our people. People out there are having a hard time. People at the Otechike, uh, that means having a hard, it's hard, it's having, we're having a hard time here, but like, you know, we always come through this, this these situations. So um, that's, um, I wish I could do this interview outside where you can see the uh, geography of the Wounded Knee Valley here. It's awesome, it's, it's a spectacle to see. I'm going to, uh, probably sing one more song and then I'm gonna sign off. Okay, this song is talking about friendship, so it's about a friend. It doesn't matter if it's Lakota or Washichu, anyway, it's about a friend. Kola hewa yay Kola yay Kola wa che a pe cha ya Wash de wa ranke our ancestors saw the world end once. That whole life was gone. Now we're on the other side of the apocalypse. The different wrongs that have been done to Native peoples are just so sickening. I mean, they even had slogans like, kill the Indian, save the man. That's genocide. Millions of people all across the Americas systematically wiped out, starting here on the East Coast. That's the reason that we don't have that relationship with some of those traditional foods anymore. 
what's popping? I see onions. Yeah, we have uh, red onions, yellow onions. Matcha, covered squash. You ready? We're salmon people. Like, what do we do if our salmon don't come back? What I've come to understand is if we want to maintain our culture, then we have to have buffalo as a vital part of our communities. What we're doing is reintroducing our young people to the land, the food, and our traditional ways of healing. Working at the farm has brought a lot of healing to my life. I've been clean 16 years, June now. I learned to heal through harvesting our traditional food. We're celebrating Apache Foodways in a kitchen that was built by Apaches for Apaches. It's this movement among all indigenous people that they're finally, they're listening. And it's like music when you hear the drum, it's calling you. And it's Mother Earth, and Mother Earth's heart's beating. And she's talking to all of us that we need to do something. You know, it's inside first, I think. Before there was corn, I had to get this.